Well, welcome to this session of Race Journeys Conversations. Today's conversation question is, many feel that traditional institutions of religion, government, and the nuclear family aren't working for them. Still surveys suggest a deep yearning of people for connectivity and meaning in their lives. What might connectivity and meaning look like outside the traditional forms associated with our American core values of God, country, and family? So the Atlantic Magazine, September 5th, featured an article by staff writer, writer Derek Thompson entitled, Elite Failure Has Brought Americans to the Edge of an existential crisis. Here's what the author said. In 1998, the Wall Street Journal and NBC News asked several hundred young Americans to name their most important values. Work ethic led the way. After that, large majorities picked patriotism, religion, and having children. 20 on years later, the same pollsters asked the same questions of today's 18 to 38 year olds, members of the millennial and the younger Z generation. The results published last week in the Wall Street Journal showed a major value shift among adults. Today's respondents were 10%, 10 percentage points less likely to value having children and 20 points less likely to highly prize patriotism or religion. The nuclear family, religious fealty, and national pride, family, God, and country are a holy trinity of American traditionalism, so writes Thompson, the fellow who wrote this article. The fact of allegiance to all three being in precipitous decline tells us something important about the evolution of American society. Thompson goes on to say that the poll is mostly about the erosion of traditional Western faith. People under 30 account for one third of this nation's worshipers in only three major religions, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. Millennials are almost three times more likely than boomers to say they don't believe in God, 16% versus 6%. The author, Derek Thompson, observes that not only are these young adults unlikely to call themselves Protestants, but to call themselves either Democrats or Republicans. They appear anti-affiliation, or even less likely than the Generation X, that's the group older than them, largely people in their 40s and early 50s. They're less likely than they are to call themselves environmentalists. They are less likely to be loyal to specific brands and less likely to trust authorities, companies, unions, or institutions. Sometimes critics, often from the older generations, have identified them as coddled. But another view of them is that they commit crimes at historically low rates and have attended college at historically high rates. As Thompson puts it, quote, they have done everything right, sprinting at full speed while staying between the white lines, and their reward has been less ownership, more debt, and an age of existential catastrophe. They wake in many mornings to discover some new pillar of the world has crumbled overnight. Thompson wonders, why would they lust for ancient affiliations. As the kids say, Thompson quotes, hashtag burn it all down. We talked a little bit about this issue going on across the religious spectrum today, especially with the younger folks, of uh, wondering, should we just burn it all down or should we deconstruct it and salvage some elements, maybe repurpose them and give them new life because they're precious to us. Interestingly now, this new American skepticism is not limited to younger adults. 
Thompson cites this Atlantic article, came out just this past spring, by uh, an art, this, uh, which came out this past spring, this study he cites. Researchers Catherine Eden and Timothy Nelson at Princeton, Andrew Cherlin at Johns Hopkins, and Robert Francis, now at Whitworth University, published a paper based on lengthy interviews between 2000 and 2013 with older, low-income men without a college degree in black and white working class neighborhoods, largely in the Northeast. At first look, these men look completely different than the demographic of those younger college educated millennials and Zers. But many of these men have been disconnected from the union, pension paying jobs of their fathers, and they are rejecting American institutions in much the same way as millennials and Generation Z. They are turning away from organized religion even faster than the millennials and Gen Zs. Church attendance among white men without a college degree has fallen even more than among white college graduates. This is an overview of them. They remain deeply spiritual without being traditionally devout. They're avoiding church and preferring instead to browse the internet and libraries for, quote, makeshift pieces of a religious self, close quote. They are attempting to renegotiate their relationship with religion by picking and choosing elements of various religious traditions that they find appealing. They have mistrust of religious leaders as well as what they refer to as political elites. Third, many reject the nuclear family in their own way. Their marriage rates have declined lockstep with their church attendance. But the, author, the authors note that a number of these men were eager to have close relationships with their children, even if they did not have a relationship with their mother. While many have given up on romance, they saw opportunities to have relations with their kids as a way of fixing their own mistakes, thus giving back to communities, quote, in ways that they believe can make the world a better place, close quote. Both the older men and younger generations struggle with their attachments to faith, family, and country, and are facing similar challenges with their mental health. Anxiety, depression, and suicidality have increased to unprecedented levels among young people. Meanwhile, death from drugs and suicide, so-called deaths of despair, which are concentrated in the white working class, have soared in the past two decades, reaching the highest levels ever recorded by the federal government. Thompson also reports that Americans seem to be suffering from and dying of new levels of loneliness in an age of crumbling institutions. The older working class men in this paper desperately want meaning in their lives, but they lack the social structures that have historically been the surest vehicles for meaning making. They want to be fathers without nuclear families. They want spirituality without organized religion. They want psychic empowerment from work in, a, in an economy that has reduced their economic power. They want freedom from pain and misery at a time when the pharmaceutical solutions to those are addictive and deadly. They want pride and esteem and belonging that people have always wanted. So the point here is that the ends of millennials and Zs are similarly traditional. The Wall Street Journal NBC survey reflected that this group was more likely than Gen Xers, again, the generation right in front of them, to value community involvement and more likely than all older groups to prize tolerance for others. They do not present a generation that has fallen into hopelessness, but rather a group focused on building solidarity with other victims of economic and social justice. How's that show up? They have been a huge force between equality movements like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Medicare for All, not only due to their liberal inclinations and tech savviness, but because 
Their experience in these times makes them exquisitely sensitive to institutional abuses of power and doubly eager to correct them. So to summarize, these folks have suffered a shock and a keen sense that the institutions of faith, family, and government have failed them, as has this economy. It is not so much the promise of fam family, faith, and national pride they have lost, but trust in the existing structures as reliable to provide those virtues. The older men exist in what is called, it's an anthropological term, liminal space. They are in an in-between tension of what worked in the past is no longer working, but they're not sure what exactly is going to replace it. It's a liminal space. They dwell between a certain nostalgia for the lives of their fathers and grandfathers, the stable wages, dependable pensions, even while they acknowledge that the old manufacturing jobs were often routine drudgery. The old churches failed their congregants, and traditional marriage subject, subjugated the female half of the arrangement. They exist between two eras, one of seemingly strong and quietly vulnerable traditions that ultimately failed us, and something else between the unmaking and the remaking between deconstruction and reconstruction. What should be allowed to endure or be repurposed? What should be destroyed? So, that's the backstory. There's a lot with that because especially when we try to reproduce what has had meaning in a form to us, one example that's used widely is what can we do to get them in church at 10 o'clock every Sunday? <laughs> There's a wide discussion saying, what do they want to do of anything at the same hour on the same day every week? Maybe it's a false question. A lot of our propositions that we're accustomed to were really 19th century inventions. Sunday school. Um, other things, too, that we do in church. Uh, we're this order of our service in some regards are things that are replications, but are not and always sort of have been. So our earlier Grace Journeys conversations try to talk about how do you salvage elements of what should endure and put them in new containers, new frames, new ways of doing things. We witnessed uh, in the previous Grace Journeys conversations that a Jesus-patterned biblical spirituality offered some useful, useful approaches to this cloud of what mystics have called unknowing, of being more certain what is broken than what should replace it. So I'm going to give a, a, a few bullets on this and then give a, and give a biblical response and then open up for conversation and hopefully your comments, which I will read. Certainly a large religious issue today, alive in many cultures, is... Do we have a right sense of prayer? Especially if we premise it on being certain about outcomes. This is essentially a prayer. It's in many different denominations, religious cultures. If you do this, say this prayer, you will get into heaven. You will be healed. It's a certainty. It works until it doesn't. It is a transaction approach to faith. Transactional approach to the faith journey. How can I get what I want with the least investment and the least surrender of my status quo? <coughs> Sometimes people even talk about having a religion that they use, which makes it look all the more transactional. Something you employ when it's convenient, when it works for you, when you have, when you have a perceived need. Not always when God might be calling you, but when you would find it useful. Jesus um, referred to people like this as coming in for the, to, for the loaves and fishes. There's a fascinating passage if you want to look at it, because it may not be one you're, fast, you're familiar with, John 6. Jesus has just told them what's really involved in following him. And they start leaving him. 
<laughs> they start leaving him. And Jesus asked the 12, do you want to leave? Simon Peter has the answer. Lord, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One. It's not one of those real up success things that we often read, but it is this idea that um, having a leading motive, a leading motive to have our lives made more comfortable is a bit of Jesus' light. Tastes good, less filling. The spiritual journey is one of transformation, not transaction. And as Peter indicated in his response to Jesus, trusting God is more central than certainty. In fact, the Bible is full of leading figures who share that uncertainty and their questions. Being in control of outcomes, <coughs> part of it is if thinking we could really know with certainty about an infinite God's design. This yields over and over to having to trust to God, profound trust. In Jewish arguments with God, and there's a lot arguing with God in the Bible, right? There's not a problem debating with God, arguing with God, calling God out. The only sin is in leaving the conversation. We may need to also reconsider the lens by which we are looking, including our expectation that God's greatest concern is that we would be comfortable. God's greatest concern is that we grow closer to God, to our true and larger nature, our authentic connection to the rest of humanity and God's creation. This involves enlarging our capacity for paradox, surprise, awe, wonder, and gratitude. Even in the darkness. Growing in grace, we exchange a transactional approach to our faith for a transformative one. For instance, we start making fewer deals with God. Like, if you do this for me, I promise that I will fill in the blanks. It does remind us oftentimes of a weaker moments in relationships where we have said or had said to us, if you really loved me, you'd do. That's again a transactional approach. So many folks attribute their lack of faith in God to God's failure to perform some action they were sure would have indicated God's love for them. And that's a, that's a challenge. Let's look at three liminal moments for people of God across the Bible. Uh, a little bit ago, uh, three years now, I guess, probably, I gave a couple of talks to the teen audience that was part of Michael Beckwith's International Agape Spiritual Life Center's annual convention. He has a large New Thought megachurch near the uh, L.A. airport. Uh, my message to the audience was that in the Bible, there are three elements to the spiritual journey that are repeated over and over and over again. They are exodus, wilderness, and promised land. You might recall that when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to explain his, uh, his mission, his purpose, where his life was, he basically did this. He used this analogy on the famous speech uh, on the Washington Mall. He was citing Moses coming to speak to the children of Israel, saying, um, <coughs> I have been to the mountaintop, and I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, Remember, Moses didn't, nor did Dr. King. But I tell you, we as a people will get to the promised land. This is an inescapable pattern of the spiritual journey. Leaving, searching, claiming, moving through Exodus wilderness journey. 
let's use three three times this appears twice the Old Testament, one the New Testament. One is with Moses and the children of Israel. Now I'm going to be provocative. That's kind of my role here to kind of realize how this sounds to a lot of people who don't have necessarily a deep faith background or a way to contextualize the questions. God says to Moses, I have seen the suffering of my people. Have you ever wondered how that might have sounded at that time? Really? This didn't start yesterday. We've been suffering 400 years. Where have you been? Why now? It's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? The loving and attending God showing up. And maybe it's why some of the people had their questions about leaving to follow Moses. It is a hard thing to get them to leave Egypt. What do they leave Egypt for? The promised land, right? Did anyone say that they would leave Egypt to go die in the wilderness? But all but two of them did. Is that a paradox? That something that seems a contradiction of sorts. Was that that people would speculate? Was that part of God's plan? If not a plan, a possibility God considered before inviting them to leave Egypt. It proved easier to take them out of slavery than to take slavery out of the people, and that's why another generation had to rise. It's a really interesting question of how do you move? And then once they go into, into the promised land, uh, they have a long struggle to find their place in that land and their relationship to those who are different from them. In the exile, um, Judah had been defeated by Babylon and they stripped the top layer basically of society, the most productive contributing members, and took them to Babylon kind of decimating the ones who were left behind. And the people were in exile. They got conflicting, if you read the Bible, some conflicting messages. Some kept folks in mind going back someday and return. Others want to emphasize, you've got to flourish where you are. Here was a big question. In, in antiquity, gods were rather geographic. The God of Israel did not like being put in a box. Um, he never asked for a temple. But he did occupy the first one. There's no record he particularly went into the subsequent ones. But they wondered, can God go with us to Babylon? Can we take who we are to this new land? If we didn't have a structure, if we didn't have a design, how would we be? That was kind of paradoxical because they thought what they were about was preserving this temple. But God says, no, I can travel. I can be there. And uh, it becomes a great story because when they want to go back to, to return, about maybe 50 years later, a lot of people don't remember ever having been there. They've been born and raised and are adults. How many want to go back? Some want to stay. And then the idea emerges about who was the leadership that brought us back. A lot of us have loved a story of Nehemiah that we read as a child and how he stood up to distractions to keep him from building the wall. It's a great story, and it's a true story, as far as we know. It's just not all the story. Remember Paul Harvey's great promise? Now you'll hear the rest of the story. How do we live with great leaders like that in this case, Nehemiah teaming up with Ezra to lead a kind of um, ethnic cleansing of Jerusalem by forcing all those who weren't Jews and were in marriage to Jews to leave. Talk about separating families and tears and gnashing. Does it seem paradoxical that a God would empower leadership that is practicing such an exclusive, judgmental um, enforcement of uh, a purity standard measured a certain way by the people. And finally, 
Jesus and the early church. Um, when the church started after, after Jesus had left and the Holy Spirit had come, which in John's gospel is really the continued presence of Jesus. Jesus says, I got to go or the, or the, uh, in John or the Spirit won't come. The Spirit continues to be that presence of Jesus with us even after he's gone. But they have big discussions about who should get to be part of the church. And I had to be circumcised. All the leaders of the church were Jewish. Jesus was a Jew. So the initial thought was, well, all the new members of the church, including the adult males, have to be circumcised and follow strict dietary rules. It became a big issue. And for the first two generations, the first two generations after Jesus in Jerusalem, the church kind of hid under the shadow of the temple. They were known by Rome as a sect of Judaism. That freedom from military service had other benefits as well. It wasn't really until the temple was destroyed and they had to come out there that they began to separate. And you see really that the people who had the ball in the start, the people who founded the church, really become pretty marginalized within the next 20 years. You don't hear much about uh, Christian leadership out of Jerusalem after the temple's gone. That seems a little paradoxical. Um, they began a mission to include the rest of the world, which soon eclipsed the Jewish roots by having Greeks and other, other communities become part of the Christian faith. So we ask the question in seeing these contradictions, it doesn't look like a straight arrow path. It's not certainly just about preserving the past. Where is God in these transitions? Present in our tears, our fears, in the injustice we suffer, but not always to fix it in the way we imagine, certainly not in our timeline. Much of God's presence is in how we are there for each other, how we re-examine our expectations, how we unself our approach and surrender to God. So we're going to invite your comments on this conversation and on questions we've raised, especially this one. Can we find a comfort in uncertainty, in contradiction? At when, and what seems, seems to us to be unanswered prayers, would that, what would that require of us? Would it require a type of purification that we love God simply for the joy of loving God, not for the ends of doing so? Jesus patterned biblical spirituality. Did anyone think Jesus' instruction to pick up your own cross, remember what that sounded like to people who knew about the cross and the horrible, horrible death it evoked. Jesus says, pick one up, carry it. Really? It was something his audience really struggled with. And also, what are the stories you hear about his followers? Did they all demonstrate a prosperous retirement on the med? Why would you follow this church? Why would you follow this savior? It must have been for something far more profound than the rewards, than the outcomes, than the transactions. We don't often be successful in making distinctions in thinking that a lot of pastors have said this, if I don't promise the reward, whether it's this world healing or prosperity or next world comfort, why would people follow? Uh, Francis Chan, who's somebody we've read in our community, uh, a pastor out in Southern California, says really the promise that we've grown up sharing is how can we make life more comfortable here on earth and then we go to heaven and it gets even more comfortable. Sometimes we step back and realize with Job, Job received his blessing in loving God through a lot of argument, a lot of darkness, a lot of tension, but he had it before he got the restoration of his wealth and family. That's significant. Maybe as a provocative prompt there, I'm going to read a short prayer um, here as we conclude. 
This is by Thomas Merton, probably one of the best known spiritual writers of the 20th century. His book, The Seven Story Mountain, has become a real classic. And he wrote this little prayer, and maybe it pulls together, where a lot of people come to when they want to come to a real surviving sense of the faith. That's not going to look like what we thought it was going to look like when we were young. Uh, but it may be something even better. Certainly more sustainable. This is Thomas Merton's prayer from his book, Thoughts in Solitude. My Lord, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I know I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may not know anything about it. Therefore, will I trust you always though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Thank you for joining us.